it safe, who gets it first, and the big one, when will life get back to normal? Dr. Barry Pecos is here to help answer all of your vaccine questions. He is no stranger to public health. He worked. As That's what it sounded medical. like a year ago in December of 2020 on an open line radio show on the CBC with special guest Dr. Barry Pecos, heralding the arrival of Pfizer and other COVID vaccines as a game changer. Pecos correctly predicted life would be somewhat normal in the spring and summer of 2021. And well, he was right about that, thanks to the rollout of the vaccines. But now the world is in a different place for us and for him. Record numbers of COVID cases are walloping the country, just as Pecos accepted the job as the chief medical officer of health for Ontario's York region. It's an area with nine cities and towns north of Toronto, well over a million residents to look after, including Markham and Thornhill, the most densely Jewish area in Canada. So the fact that Dr. Pecos is an Orthodox Jew, wears a kippah, and studied at a yeshiva on top of all his advanced medical training in public health, puts the doctor in a unique strategic position. In his new job, as he liaises with synagogues, Jewish schools, camps, and religious organizations to fight COVID, while also trying to personally keep the Sabbath and Jewish holidays, even now with Omicron. And having that time not only to rest, but, you know, I am not answering my email. I am not engaging with, with my computer, with, with the media whatsoever, with COVID really um, is incredibly important. And, you know, if it hadn't have been for that, you know, I don't know where I would be and more broadly in, in my life generally, but certainly during COVID. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Monday, December the 27th, 2021. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. I promised we would bring you a show about the COVID situation, although many of you may be on holidays, but I felt it was too important to wait till January. Now, you certainly can find lots of solid medical advice out there, but not from a specifically Jewish framework, and so that's where Dr. Barry Pecos comes in. He's a day school graduate. He went to Toronto's Chat High School. And since then, in his 20-year medical career in public health, he has worked all over the world, including in Israel. He taught public health students at the U of T. He still takes shifts in emergency rooms in northern Ontario hospitals. And he does ritual circumcisions. He also was involved in an outreach group of Jewish medical experts. They called themselves Kol HaCovid. And they set themselves up earlier this year to advise the religious Jewish community in the Toronto area about COVID. Now in his new job, Dr. Pekas has to keep an eye on all faiths, but he reports that as far as Jewish COVID goes, here's what's new. Hanukkah parties led to new COVID outbreaks in the Jewish community, especially at several schools that had to be closed. He says there are still some pockets who refuse to believe in vaccines. And... About 70% of the ultra-Orthodox community in Toronto has already had COVID. Meanwhile, there are continued challenges posed by large religious families traveling and by non-religious people who go south and are maybe getting COVID in airports or in Florida. Coming up, Dr. Barry Pekis will be here to explain what to expect about this new COVID wave. But first, here's what's making news elsewhere in Canada right now. I'm Stacey Shakin in Calgary, Alberta, and this is what Jewish camp sounds like. Montreal's Federation CJA has relaunched its community helpline for anyone who needs groceries or other help with other problems related to COVID. The number to call is 514-734-1411. Spokesman Glenn Nashen says Federation is working closely with OMETS and the Communauté Séfarade Unifiée du Québec and the Cumming Centre to coordinate the response. They're also revising their list of volunteers who reached out last year and asking anybody who wants to sign up again to help to go to federationcja.org. Dr. Barry Pekis joins us now. It's really an honor to have you. First of all, congratulations on uh, your appointment as the Chief Medical Officer of Health for York Region. Thank you very much. Recently, you were quoted as saying in the York Region that you're not in favor yet of opening up to 18 and plus for the boosters because there are much more vulnerable and important populations and a scarcity that you have to balance. Um, You know, everybody wants these boosters. How does halacha play a role um, aside from the scarcity, which is something that's government supplied 
in, in why you decided to do this? So, you know, it isn't much of a dilemma in that case. And so, you know, I didn't have to use those tools. It is pretty clear that's what we should be doing. You know, getting those vaccine boosters to the population who needs it now for the next two to three weeks. Once we're done that population of, you know, over 300,000 people in York region, then we'll move on to the 18 plus. The 18 plus people still have access through pharmacies and have access through a couple of other local um, yeah, local centers, but you know they don't have great access. They don't have appointments, and and the reason for that is that it 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 would be somewhat unconscionable and unethical and just you know bad public health practice to have a otherwise healthy twenty year old um, you know getting a vaccine booster over a seventy five year old immunocompromised person, right? That wouldn't wouldn't make sense. And and as a matter of policy, we made that the case. And I know actually many others, whether it's our city council or our regional council rather, or even some pharmacies. That have taken on that same approach. It, it makes a lot of sense. There are people who are younger who are upset about that, and understandably so. Um, and their but, parents and their parents <laughs> and their parents, perhaps certainly. And, and I'm a parent of, of five kids, and I understand that. Um, but but certainly, I think people, you know, if you look into it and, and just take a moment, you know, to, to step out of your own personal circumstance, which is what we do and try to do in public health, to recognize actually that I personally. Um, I'm actually benefiting from those 50 plus having those booster doses because now the hospital capacity is actually more accessible to me as an individual. So, you know, it does take a little bit of thinking and it, it certainly is frustrating not to be able to get what people think, um, you know, that they deserve at a particular time. But I think it makes it makes good sense for almost any dimension. So pushback um, about this and other things. Let's focus on the Jewish aspect if we can when you spoke to our colleagues at Bonjour Chai in May, you were having challenges navigating getting Jewish community members of certain other Orthodox and schools and synagogues to get with the program. You know, the challenges are still the same. It's the ultra Orthodox community or the Orthodox community in Toronto um, is very mobile. You know, many children per family. Um, and, and both of those things mean that they're more likely to, you know, catch COVID, transmit COVID. Um, larger households have been, you know, it's been a risk factor throughout and more mobile means generally where they're going is to United to, to New York or, you know, certain parts of Europe or Israel and bringing it back and forth, uh, COVID back and forth potentially from communities where it's spreading at various times. Um, you know, that's somewhat settled down now in the sense that, um, you know, there's been a lot of COVID uh, out there um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70%. Uh, I would estimate of the ultra orthodox population probably has had COVID. Um, many of them are vaccinated now as well. Um, certainly, you know, it's something I've raised in many forums in that we talk about vulnerable marginalized populations, whether they're indigenous, black, Hispanic, um, uh, essential care workers, for, for example, you know, from the Philippines, who all have much higher rates of COVID. Um, those COVID rates are dwarfed by the COVID rates in the ultra orthodox community um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but, you know, the the acuity at this time uh, and, and also the size of that community uh, means that, you know, chances are there are not going to be that many people who are adversely affected now. It certainly has been a significant issue before, but with Omicron and, and how things are transmitting, we're going to have to see, um, you know, how things might change. When we spoke, well, when you spoke earlier in May, um, you had mentioned getting um flyers and phone calls that people were receiving in order to dissuade people from getting vaccinated for fertility reasons, what have you. And you went out and you were trying to stop that. What was that like? Talk about that experience. Yeah. So again, that's not in a medical officer of health role, but rather as a community member role. And, and the, the task force we had called a COVID, um, the Jewish Community Task Force in Toronto. Um, and, you know, it was just a sort of grassroots approach to countering some of the misinformation. That is out there, and I think one of the interesting things about many, you know, smaller communities, and particularly the ultra orthodox or the orthodox community, um, is you know they have their own media outlets, and those media outlets are connected to many that are in the United States, particularly in Lakewood, for example. And so um, there's additional opportunities for people to go down rabbit holes of misinformation and to trust those within their circle for some types of information, whether they be rabbis or other media outlets. Um, and, you know, that was a challenge at times. I think people have settled now into those, you know, it's been a year. So those who, you know, still hold on to those conspiracy theories still hold on to them. Um, others have got vaccinated and have moved on. And, you know, it, it remains a challenge 
but not one that I'm addressing as a medical officer of health in York region. Some of the people who uh, protest vaccines and, and lockdowns and, and passports um, use a lot of uh, yellow stars and uh, neo-Nazi terminology. They say basically COVID, every single aspect of COVID is Jewish. I don't know if you've seen some of this stuff. Um, have you had this personally directed at you or other healthcare professionals? And if so, how have you experienced No, I try to ignore that, <laughs> really. And, and I think, you know, I, I look at it from a very positive lens in that um, I think Ontario, Canada, in general, compared to many, many other jurisdictions, of course, compared to the United States, but many others, um, has such a smaller proportion of people who are, you know, anti-vax, you know, uh, uh, COVID hesitant. I mean, you know, we have 90% of our population who's had one dose uh, and, and, you know, getting more and more as the 5 to 11s, you know, come through, you know, so that leaves probably close to 5 to 7% who are on that fringe. They're a very vocal fringe, and many of the things you know they say are, are very unpleasant, um, but it, it is very different. You know, It's materially different than dealing with a society um, like in the States, but many, many other places, um, even other provinces in Canada, where you know, it's a much more significant proportion of the population, and you really need to deal with not just a, a vociferous small group, but you know, a more you know, a substantial uh, minority of the community who is either anti-vax or, or pushing back on many of these measures. You know, it, it's wonderful how reasonable people in York region, Ontario generally, and Canada in general, uh, how reasonable people are. You know, when we shut down things generally, we have mobility data that shows that people, you know, do the right thing for the most part, um, which is which is great and, and which, you know, bears out in, in what we've seen uh, uh, to this point, which is, you know, only four and a half percent of Canadians, closer to five perhaps now, have had COVID yet. It's going to change with Omicron uh, compared to, you know, uh, the states, which is many multiples of that, 15, probably closer to 20 percent. Israel, far, far higher. Many places in Europe, far, far higher. And then deaths concomitantly also much lower. So, you know, despite our older population than many countries, we're we're doing very well. So, you know, there, there are certainly directed attacks at all medical officers of health and, and people suing suing uh, medical officers of health for silly reasons. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I, I'm, I'm quite pleased and optimistic uh, about how things have been going so far. Have you had a death threat like Dr. Kaplan Murr had? Um, I've had some, some threats from various sectors that were, um, you know, I, I'm I'm not a risk averse person, and and I I uh, um, I'm can identify. I think when when there's a true threat, I've had certainly things that made me feel somewhat uncomfortable, uh, but fortunately not not you know true threats um, to myself or my family. And and again, that that's where are know, those threats coming from? Are they coming from the Jewish community at all? Any of them? There there are threats that come from a variety of, of places, uh, and and some I would call threats, and some I would call just very serious admonishments. Um, but um, you know they're they're out there, and I think speaking to them directly doesn't always serve you know the purpose of protecting <laughs> all of us. But but they've been out there, and and we've had all kinds of ways of of dealing with with them, whether it be in the formal roles that you know with with our our legal staff at York Region prior to that you know, uh, in the community itself, making sure people understood that that kind of behavior, that kind of language isn't appropriate. And, and for the most part, actually, people have responded, you know, positively and reasonably to that. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you wanted our audience to understand? No, I think from the Jewish community perspective, I think it really is an opportunity to think more about community. You know, that's what we've seen over the past two years, certainly. You know, again, prior to my role as York Medical Officer of Health, you really understand what community means and what gathering means. You know, we know that the Jewish community, as well as many other communities, gathers much more than other communities do. You know, people gather for Minyan three times a day. We have worked extensively, you know, and engaged with the Muslim community. And it's been absolutely wonderful because their people, the, the Muslim community task force understands what we mean when we say we get together three times, they get together five times a day and how important that is for people. Um, and larger families and, and, and um, you know, extended families and community networks um, that are really important. And, and I think COVID has helped us understand that dynamic. Um, and, and of course, the halachic aspect of things. I think uh, one of the things that's been incredibly important uh, for me and, and is to anybody uh, really observant Jews is keep is Shabbat, is, is having that time. Um, and, you know, I think that is a lesson for observant, non-observant Jews alike, and has actually been something um, that I've shared with 
people uh, who are non-Jewish and before COVID as well, people who work in global health where, you know, uh, they're very invested in the work they do, saving global populations and focusing on equity and, and all of that kind of work, which is just incredibly urgent, uh, as urgent as the pandemic seems to us right now. And having that space where you don't engage for one day a week is just, you know, incredibly important for resilience and your capacity to work uh, on these kind of important issues. You haven't gotten COVID yourself, have you? I have not. I have not. And nobody in your immediate family? I mean, I, I, no, they have not. Generally, we wouldn't share if, if they have, but they have not. And, you know, until recently, most people in my social circle, you know, hadn't had it. And other people's social circle, every single person they know has had it. And, and that, in fact, in the, you know, whether it's modern Orthodox, national religious, more sort of black hat versus altered Orthodox in many different communities, you know, very different circles, very different dynamics of transmission. But in my personal circle, uh, even social circle, until very recently, uh, almost nobody I know has had it. Whereas in very close per social circle, to me, almost everybody uh, seems to have had it. Yeah. So, you know, I expect that I might, you know, I've, I've had a booster dose because I work clinically, as is my wife. My children are all vaccinated now thankfully, uh, fully vaccinated. Um, uh, I, I, to be honest, fully expect some of them might get it at some point um, because of how transmissible Omicron is. And, and I'm confident that the vaccine is going to protect us from serious illness. So I, I think, you know, hopefully if that is a message, you know, we don't know what's going to happen on a broader society perspective because, you know, there are great challenges. But I think from a personal perspective, you know, people who are, you know, doing the best they can to keep their gathering small, that they've been fully vaccinated, uh, if they can be, including the booster when appropriate, that they, they can be confident that the world is going to continue with a lot of chaos around them. But in terms of their personal safety, you know, I, I think, um, you know, there isn't a need to panic, there's need to be aware. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. We will be back on Monday, January 3rd, with a full slate of shows. Today's listener shout-out goes to Claire Horowitz, who wrote to tell me that she thinks the CJN Daily Podcasts are so informative. That's so nice. Thanks, Claire, and keep on listening. Meanwhile, we'll end the episode with this sneak peek of an upcoming story. You'll meet a Canadian family who just travelled to the island of Aruba to help complete the writing of a new Torah. It's a gift for the small but growing Orthodox Jewish community in the Southern Caribbean. Well, we heard about Chabad Aruba. We just met Rabbi Blasberg on the street, like about eight years ago. And he heard us conversing in Hebrew. And he was kind of fascinating. How is it possible that we're meeting in here in Aruba and the Jews meet each other? So it was really, really special. And he was uh, explaining us that he's actually building a synagogue uh, in order to get all the Jews coming to Aruba to celebrate the holidays and actually help them to enjoy, enjoy Yiddishka. And um, my husband, a couple of years ago, four years ago, lost his father. And in honor of his uh, Yorzai, we actually donated a whole first sentence in the Torah, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim ve'et ha-aretz, and that was very special for us. 